Prepare for a rude awakening. Daniel had made provision for the Messiah, and now, 500 years later, the executors of his will brought their treasure-laden caravan into the city gates of Jerusalem with the proclamation, we have come to worship he who is born king of the Jews. Herod sent them to the neighboring village of Beit Lechem, where the prophet Micah said the Mashiach would be born. The very night that Yosef was commanded in a vision to take the child and his mother and flee into Egypt, the night that Herod's orders to execute all male babies was issued, Daniel's treasure was delivered right to their door. Think about it. Yosef was so impoverished that he could only afford the poor man's sacrifice of two pigeons at the child's dedication, 40 days after his birth. Certainly, Yosef was not yet in possession of any gold, frankincense, or myrrh. But approximately a year and a half later, on the very night they had to escape into Egypt, the provision for their flight and sustenance arrived by special courier. That provision had been made 500 years earlier and prepared for the moment it was needed. The Almighty is the master of drama. When there appears to be no hope, His salvation is revealed. Truth is always more exciting than fictitious traditions and fairy tales based on ignorance of the scriptures. Leave your Western Gentile mentality behind as we explore the Bible from a Jewish or Hebrew perspective. This is the paradigm shift for which you have been waiting an entire lifetime. Who are you? We are three wise men. What? We are three wise men. Well, what are you doing creeping on the car shed at two o'clock in the morning? That doesn't sound very wise to me. We are astrologers. We have come from the east. Is this some kind of joke? We wish to praise the infant. We must pay homage to him. You all drunk! Out! Come on, out! No. Burst in here with tales about oriental fortune tellers! Come on, out! No, no, we must see him. Go and praise someone else's... God! We were led by a star. Led by a bottle of all I go on out. Well, we must see him. We have both presents. Out! Gold, frankincense, myrrh. Well, why didn't you say he's over there? Sorry the place is a bit of a mess. By what name are you calling him? Uh, Brian. We worship you, O Brian, who are Lord over us all. Praise unto you, Brian, and to the Lord our Father. Amen. We do a lot of this, then. What? This praising. No, 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 no. Uh, well, um, if you drop in by again, do pop in. <laughs> and thanks a lot for the gold and frankincense. Uh, but don't worry too much about the myrrh next time, all right? <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> well, weren't they nice? <laughs> oh, that mine. Look at that. <laughs> here, 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 that's, that's mine. Hey, hey, you forget it. In the book of Ezekiel, he wrote, The angel brought me to the gate of the house of the Lord, and I beheld women weeping for Tammuz. Then said he unto me, Thou shalt see greater abominations. And he brought me into the inner court, where about twenty-five men had their back toward the temple, and they faced the east and worshipped the sun. Sun worship and the worship of Tammuz started in ancient Babylon. Nimrod built a city that was the center of his world government in which he was proclaimed God. His kingdom bore totalitarian rule over the people, reducing men to slaves in his political, economic, and religious system. According to ancient Jewish writings, Nimrod was slain by Noah's son Shem and his body parts were scattered throughout the land of Shinar. Nimrod's devoted followers erected a tower that reached into the heavens, 
a huge obelisk like we see here in Caesarea, and in Washington, D.C., Heliopolis, Egypt, Rome, London, Paris, and New York City. This phallic symbol is the image of the uncircumcised penis of Nimrod, the father of Babylonian sun god worship. The Creator calls this the image of jealousy and an abomination. This Roman created abomination found recently in its proper state, toppled over and in pieces, was rebuilt in the summer of 2001. In the month of its completion, a gay pride parade was held in Tel Aviv, a befitting inauguration for this obelisk re-erection, and in the month of Tammuz, no less. Nimrod's widow Beltus, also known as Semiramis, not willing to let the kingdom slip through her fingers when her husband was killed, proclaimed that Nimrod had ascended into the heavens, was now the sun god, and that he had impregnated her with the rays of the sun. At least that was her story. Her child was born on the winter solstice on the ancient calendar, December 25th. Forevermore, this day would be celebrated as the day that Nimrod, the sun god, was reborn as Tammuz. The birth date of the Babylonian sun god is a shock to some in the West, but common knowledge among Jewish scholars and historians. Israel was taken captive into Babylon for their disobedience concerning sun god worship. We had also been captives in Egypt, where we took on the worship of Ra, the Egyptian sun god, who was born on December 25th. In 168 BC, the Syrian Greek general Antiochus Epiphanes occupied Jerusalem and set up a statue of Zeus in the temple on Zeus's birthday and proclaimed that Zeus was God on December 25th. And when Rome conquered Jerusalem, they hung Jewish patriots on the cross of Mithra as a sacrifice to the Roman sun god who was born on, you guessed it, December 25th. The confusion of languages at the Tower of Babel scattered the heathen into the far corners of the earth and confused the names of their gods, but the worship rituals remain much the same throughout the earth. There is one date that I assure you, Yahshua of Nazareth was not born, December 25th. But who was? Little baby Tammuz. Tammuz, so the story goes, was gored to death by a wild boar in a hunting accident when he was 40 years old. The 40 days of weeping for Tammuz was instituted one day for each year of his life in which sun god worshipers would deny themselves a pleasure in this life for the sake of Tammuz's pleasure in the afterlife. When Tammuz's mother died many years later, the exalted Queen of Heaven was sent back to earth by the gods on the first Sunday after the vernal equinox. Nimrod's wife arrived in a giant egg which landed in the Euphrates River and broke open to allow her to emerge reincarnated as the bare-breasted goddess of sexual desire, Easter. To proclaim her divinity, Easter changed a bird into an egg-laying rabbit. In this dingy Hinnom Valley Tammuz cave, the occult priest would impregnate virgins on the altar of Easter at the Easter sunrise service, and a year later they sacrificed those three-month-old infants on the same altar and dyed Easter eggs in the blood of those sacrificed babies. To this day, one Christian denomination only allows their Easter eggs to be dyed a single specific color, blood red. They have no idea how the tradition started or what it rehearses. But now you know, Easter Sunday is now the day that culminates the 40 days of weeping for Tammuz, called by many Lent. On this day, entire denominations continue a tradition of slaughtering the wild boar that killed Tammuz and eating ham on Easter Sunday. There is one date that I assure you, Yahshua did not rise from the grave, Easter Sunday. Frequently, Easter and Passover are an entire month apart. Why? They represent the worship of two different gods. Easter is celebrated according to a pagan sun god calendar. Passover is celebrated according to the observance of the biblical new moon and the ripening of the barley in the land of Israel. Yahshua kept the feast of Passover. All of the rehearsals that were embedded in that feast were fulfilled the year of his death and resurrection. He was the final Passover sacrifice. His sinless blood paid the price for our redemption. 
On the other hand, Easter is a rehearsal of child sacrifice and fertility rites of pagan sun god worshipers. Which celebration should you keep? That depends on which god you serve. It's your choice. But now you understand why the Holy One instructs us. Do not learn the way of the heathen and how they worship their gods and then do the same to me. It is an abomination. Christmas and Easter are not the celebrations of the birth and resurrection of Yahshua of Nazareth, but the watered-down continuation of child sacrifice festivals that were hatched in Babylon 2,000 years before his birth. We all recognize that the pagan calendar, which has been adopted by the Christian world, names every day of the week and nearly every month of the year after a pagan god or fallen angel. But many are surprised to see that the fourth month on the modern Jewish calendar is named after the pagan god Tammuz. In direct violation of the Torah, thou shalt not allow the names of other gods to come out of your mouth. I only speak the names of pagan gods for the same reasons that the prophets of Israel spoke their names, to expose the sick, twisted traditions that we have inherited from our disobedient ancestors. Religious schemes have been fabricated by the mind of man that have nothing to do with how God desires to be worshiped. Pop Christian culture adorns itself with the latest hip Jesus apparel and jewelry that asked, WWJD, what would Jesus do? But seldom opens the scriptures to find out. Yahshua found the place where it was written, said what was written, and did what was written. He did not make up his own theology as he went along. He always obeyed the Torah and said that the Father seeks those who would worship him in spirit and in the truth that was written in stone over 3,400 years ago. When we are ignorant of his instructions, we naturally slip back into Babylonian sun god worship while we say we are doing it for him. Israel expressed the same ignorance of God's ways when we built a golden calf and said, tomorrow is a feast to Yahweh. He was absolutely furious. He wanted to incinerate us all. Occasionally I hear the emotionally charged defense. That is not what Christmas and Easter mean to me. But I don't care what they mean to you. I don't worship you. The Almighty says that it is an abomination to him. Just as the Almighty told Abraham in Genesis, he tells those living at the end of the age in the book of Revelation, come out of Babylon. Yeah! <laughs> Throughout this series, we will be exploring the Hebrew Scriptures, both Testaments, from an Hebraic or Jewish perspective. The Great Commission was to the Jew first and the Jewish disciples gave their lives to spread the good news of the Messiah to the Gentile world. We are going to let the Jews interpret the scriptures that the Jews have written, and I promise to give ample time to allow the Gentiles to interpret all the scriptures that the Gentiles have written. I'm Michael Rood, inviting you to join us again next time for A Rood Awakening. And I'll see you when the smoke clears.